Kia ora katoa katoa, nau mai, hare mai. Welcome everyone for getting to grips with artificial intelligence in evaluation presented by Dr. Paul Digan. This seminar is recorded and it will be uploaded to the AES YouTube channel in four weeks. I am Marini Sanka, the co-convener of AES Aotearoa, and my colleague Rula will monitor the chat section um, along, with, along with Paul. Who will who can also see the chat section, uh, which I cannot at the moment. Um, so we will also have um, 15 minutes at the end for Q and A. But in the meantime, do feel free to put your thoughts and questions um, down in the chat, and it could be addressed as the presentation is going. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we all come from. I'm speaking from Pornike, Wellington, Aotearoa, and I acknowledge the leaders past, present, and emerging. In tradition, with the customs of Aotearoa, I'd like to open this kore row with the karakia. He waka herenga, he fitifiri fakaro, he fitifiti kore row, ka ute maramatanga, tihe mariora. As evaluators, researchers, and policy experts, we are now all in a position to make a decision of if we use AI in our work, and if so, how we utilize it. It is therefore important that we have a clear understanding of what is AI, what it can do, its benefits, and its limitations. So today, we are all very fortunate to have an expert with us on the subject matter. Paul is a highly experienced evaluator and trainer who also has a background in psychology and technological social impact assessment. He has been a senior Fulbright scholar at the Urban Institute in Washington, DC, and has worked with numerous organizations from community-based groups through to the International Monetary Fund. And most importantly, he has just finished writing a book on AI, which will be out very soon. So, Paul, we are all so excited to hear from you. Um, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, Morena. Um, so I'm Paul Geigen from talking to you from Wellington, uh, New Zealand. So it's a delight to be. I've been, I've had a lot to do with evaluation over the years, and then I've been doing a lot of other things, a lot of strategy, and then recently doing a lot of things about AI. But it's great to sort of meld those things together into this discussion here. So there's sort of a lot of the favorite, my favorite topics are coming together here on this uh, discussion today. So um, welcome everybody to this webinar. So um, I'm going to basically, I'll just get the, if, if I'm not as, I must admit, I'm not exactly sure who's moving the slides, but who, whichever one of you is moving the slides, could you, oh, thanks very much for it. Um, could you just move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Oh. Brilliant. So what I'm planning to cover in this uh, this webinar is first of all, what can AI do for evaluators? So I just, now it's very hard to demonstrate this because we've got a, a, quite a lot of people here and everybody will be kind of, have different experiences of how they've used AI so far. So some people will have used it exhaustively and some people won't. So it's a little bit hard to know exactly how to do this, but I'll just run through a demonstration uh, fairly quickly of some of the things that AI can do. Then I want to talk about the implications of AI for evaluation practice, and I think there's a lot of them, apart from just using it as a tool. And then the social implications of AI for evaluators, which as Marie said, that's the book I'm writing at the moment. I've just, just finished writing, which, and I'll be talking about that. Fantastic. The next slide, please. Brilliant. So I'll put up a resource page for this webinar. So if you go to bulldigan.consulting slash p50, and I'll put it in the, in the chat, you will find some resources, including the, the verbatim um, session I had with ChatGPT preparing this material I'll be talking through. So as I talk through it, I won't be able to you know, discuss every detail of, of, the, of what the responses I got from ChatGPT, but you can go back at your leisure and look on the site. So this, this page has just got, um, it's got, a, first of all, it's got a, a well, it's got the chat session that I had with uh, ChatGPT I'll talk to in a moment. It's got some other resources there. One I just want to highlight is if you could move to the next day, uh, next slide, please, Marie. I've got a page on my website, which is called at pulldiving.consulting AI examples. And this shows you where AI is headed. It's really quite important we understand where AI is headed. And so this set of 
uh, examples on that website page. You don't look at it now, but go back and look at it. It's got a lot of examples of where AI is taking us because AI is a, like a, a mini, it's like a hydra. It's got many heads, many different types and styles of AI. So uh, it's, I'll be talking about what a chatbot can do for us, but there's a whole lot of other types of AI, which are really will be relevant to evaluation in various ways. Thank you very much. Could you go to the next slide, Marie, please? <laughs> Oh, thanks for someone put that up on the chat. Thank you very much. Okay, what can AI do for evaluation? Well, the idea, the, the answer is it can do lots of stuff for evaluators, a huge amount of stuff for evaluators. And I'm just going to move fairly quickly through some examples of what it can do. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So what I did, I started the session with ChatGPT. Uh, now, this is ChatGPT4. If you are going to use um, chatbots seriously, and there's a lot of different chatbots, and they're already, they're appearing in Bing, for instance, they're appearing in Google, uh, and there are, there's a lot of chatbots out there, but I've just used ChatGPT4. But if you are going to do it, it's worthwhile getting the paid subscription because that lets you use version four of ChatGPT, which is, I think, something like 30% better than version three, which is a, the free version three, which is the free version. So I'd suggest if you really want to use um, chat GPT or chatbot for doing evaluation that you get the latest the latest version of it would be just one thing for a starter. So now so I asked first the thing I asked it well, so I got into a session of chat GPT. Um, as I said these this these sessions if you had the paid version they 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 are captured in a chat and then you can share them. And so you see on, on that resource page I put up you'll be able to click and you'll be able to look through in more in detail at the answers that gave to my questions. So they're they're up there which you can look at later on if you wish. First point about talking to a chatbot, uh, you can you can make it be something. So acting as an expert evaluator. So you, you sort of set the scene for the chatbot. So you're saying acting as an rather than just asking the question, acting as an expert evaluator. Write a set now. What I said is write a set of outcomes for a webinar on AI and program evaluation, which is actually just for fun. It's this webinar. So I've asked it this, to write a set of outcomes, which is something that we use a lot. We use it if we're thinking about implementation evaluation, so which is formative evaluation thinking that we want to help a program uh, be well implemented. And of course, we need it for outcome evaluation. We need to have some outcomes. Next slide, please, Maria. So what it, did, what it did here was it identified a set of four uh, outcomes. So understanding AI, practical application, challenges, and future direction. So, so it gave a set of outcomes, and then so there's some outcomes under that. So you can just see it can produce outcomes for a program. You just And this could be any program you could ask it. It can produce a set of outcomes. I'll talk later on about how accurate all of this is, but it's it's having just skimmed through it, it's not too bad, and you can have a look later on yourselves. You know, it's sort of like about 80%. You can imagine making it a little bit better, but it's actually it's sort of as good as many, many kind of evaluation reports that I would read the material in general that it produces. Um, next slide, please. So then I said, uh, you know, as part of formative and process evaluation we would want to make sure that a, um, uh, that's right, so someone's just commented up on this chat, but these look more like actions rather than outcomes. That's right, so you can you, you don't ever want to, and I'll talk later about this, you don't want to take what uh, chatbot says um, absolutely at face value. You need to critically engage with it, but often it'll give you the opportunity to engage with it, exactly like that person saying, are they actions or are they outcomes? So then what you could say to ChatGPT, write them more as outcomes and see what it came up with. So very much a matter of engaging in a dialogue with them. The next one is um, evidence-based initiative, formative and process evaluation. Briefly summarize the evidence-based principles for running such a webinar. So that's, we need to make sure that programs are uh, based on evidence-based principles, both in the formative aspect and in the process aspect. So next slide, please, Marie. Yeah. So what it did then was it provided some evidence-based uh, information about how to run a webinar. I won't go into it, it's up on that. It should be up on the link. Um, but you, it produces something. As I say, if you read, I've just skimmed through these. If you read it, you know, it's a, it's definitely a starting point. It's not necessarily a finishing point, but it's a starting point for sparking your thinking about this. Next slide, please, Marie. So then what I said was write a methodology section for the evaluation report explaining the qualitative, the quantitative analysis plus the use of grounded theory uh, in the analysis of qualitative responses. And so then the next slide, please. 
So then it came up with the methodology section. And again, uh, we should not take these things at face value and just sort of fire them out to a client, but they do provide a really good starting point or sort of a, like a first draft that you'd, you'd have to, you'd, I would suggest you'd never, never send a word out from, from AI, which you haven't checked yourself and thought about very carefully. But it, it sort of takes you quite a way down the track. Rather than starting with a blank piece of paper, you actually, or, or often we start with an evaluation report we've written about a different subject. This actually just really starts your thinking and gets you going in terms of that. Next one, please. Okay. So then often this is just showing showing how many people say, you know, AI can't be, uh, can't be critical or can't be analytic. Here I've said justify the evaluation in terms of the o OECD DAC evaluation criteria. So you can actually get it. So in this case, it goes away, it finds what those are, and or it's got them already within its large language model, and it actually compares the methodology we've come up with with those DAC criteria. Next one, please. So there they are. Again, um, we don't have time in this webinar to read them all out, but they should be up in that, that transcript. Um, or just simply ask, you know, you just ask ChatGPT to do it again yourself. But here it's gone through and it's looked at each of those evaluation criteria, and it's actually given a rationale for why our methodology actually meets those criteria. So if you think about that in terms of justifying what we're doing as evaluators, you can see how this again gives us a real good start in terms of, of that sort of uh, anal more analytical thinking, not just summarizing, et cetera. Next one, please, Marie. Okay, so now we move on more on to methodology. So, so far we talked, we, sorry, we talked about methodology, we talked about outcomes, and now we're moving on to the actual nitty gritty of, of the methodology. So I've said, write a seven item uh, post webinar questionnaire for webinar participants. And so next slide, please, Marie. So there it is, it's produced a seven item questionnaire, which again, I haven't had a lot of time to go through, but we can um, skim through that. Um, I, there's great. So someone's just posted, uh, is it Katie? Uh, someone's posted there, but it can help you go become writer's block. Brilliant point. Yeah, exactly. It's a starting point. And then you go through and you check. And sometimes, you know, I mean, I must say, I feel it's kind of 70 to 80 percent, you know, good enough about a lot of stuff. Some think times it makes it something that's really just a, a monstrous kind of crazy thing. Uh, or sometimes it's subtle, like that first person on the chat said, are they outcomes or, or are they like, processes or activities? So so sometimes there's subtle things we have to do in terms of working with, but but it's very much a matter of working with the chat bot rather than thinking it's just going to produce all the answers, but it does help with things like writer's block. Next one, please, Marie. Uh -oh. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I just want to sort of show you the, this is really just to illustrate where you can go with this, and obviously you should play with it yourself. Um, but, you know, you've, so we've got a survey and then we go, well, detail how, how one could set the survey up in SurveyMonkey. Because, you know, we're, as evaluators, we have a, it's okay, come up with a survey, fine, but we've actually got to get it out there to people. So maybe we want to put in SurveyMonkey. So boom, next slide, please. It'll give you a detailed description of the steps you have to take to actually put that questionnaire into survey, you know, going blow by blow through the different aspects of that questionnaire, how you can put into SurveyMonkey. Now, the point I want to actually illustrate about this is that this is not restricted to it telling you how to do Survey Monkey. It's actually, you know, it could actually tell you how to put this into uh, Google Forms or all sorts of other places. But not only that, what if you go, if you look later on at my page about where AI is going, that resource page I, I suggested, in actual fact, the AI is now being able to actually use software or interact with websites. So we're not too far from the point where you'd say generate a survey monkey and, and things are moving so fast as may already be the case with a plugin to chat GPT where you say actually generate the form on survey monkey that's not not impossible not even difficult at the moment um, for that next step to happen so if you see where this is kind of heading in terms of not only the chat bot you know telling us how to do things but actually then starting to do things and I'll touch on that later on uh, in, at the final section next one please Marie Okay, now this is this is sort of just taking a slightly different angle, but this I just really wanted to illustrate what this, this what, what it can do if you get you know kind of creative. So I'm trying to demonstrate to this to you guys. So then I think, oh, I need a um I'd, I'd like to have a sample 
set of responses because I wanted to analyze those later on to show you how I can do analysis as part of evaluation. So I just said to ChatGPT, create a mocked up set of data for 20 respondents from the survey in a comma delimited format. So it's now going, it goes away. I won't demonstrate it here. It just, just goes away and it actually creates a fictitious set of responses, including qualitative and quantitative responses to that survey that it just developed early on. So this is entirely fictitious, of course, but I want, but from my point of view, I just wanted this set of responses. From an evaluator's point of view, you can see, one of my sort of feelings about evaluation is, and particularly questionnaires, is we should never design a questionnaire unless we've talk, thought about how we're going to report it, okay? Whenever I design a questionnaire for evaluation, I don't just design the questionnaire, I go, what do I want to write on the evaluation report? Obviously not having the answers, but I want to know that my questions will provide me with the kind of data uh, and, uh, and information I need for my, um, for my final report. So in terms of this, you see you, we've got a set of questions. So then you can say, chat GPT, think up a set of fictitious responses for this. And then you can make sure that when they were analyzed, they would actually, they would answer important questions. We're not talking about the content of those answers. We're talking about making sure we've asked the right questions. So you see how you can use this as part of your creative process of developing the evaluation. Yeah, Mark, as Mark just said, very handy, very handy. Yeah. So it's, it's, and I'll talk later on about being very kind of uh, fluid about the way you use, you interact with ChatGPT. Next one, please. So it went away and did that. And, and, and there's a little, it's very interesting to watch that. It actually goes away, it uses a, a thing called Python. It actually goes away and uses a piece of software. So, so people kind of think chatbots can just produce language. In order to create that set of, that set of data, it went away and used a programming language called Python. But I didn't tell it to, it just, it just went away and it knew that was the best way of doing it. Went away, created it within Python and it shows you the code when it does it and came back with that, that which you could save as a CVS, CSV file, which you could then pop into Excel if you so wish. We'll do anything you like with it. But really what I'm trying to say is, is this thing, is this, I'll get onto it at the end, but the, you know, the way AI is going, it's not just, a very static thing. It's actually a very fluid thing. It's linking to a lot of stuff. Fantastic. So I said, set up using the mock up set of results. Could you do a grounded theory analysis of the qualitative responses? So let's go. Go to the next slide. Oh, next slide, please, Tori. Thank you. Yeah. So there it's done a grounded. So I actually asked, you know, it, it, can, it knows what grounded theory is and it described the methodology in grounded theory. And then it's done, it's done a grounded theory analysis on the fictitious responses that it created. Okay. So this is sort of boxes within boxes, isn't it? It's pretty, pretty amazing. But that's that's what it's done. And again, didn't look bad for a quick eyeballing it. But, you know, I didn't look at it for long. And you can go back and have a wee look at the chat session from that website. Um, but you can see you can see some of the potential here of it actually doing qualitative analysis. I'll touch on that later on. Next one, please. Okay. Someone said they joined late. Please tell me if this is the free version or the paid version. Thanks very much. This is the paid version. And I just said at the very beginning, you, if you're going to use it seriously, just like any professional, you really have to have a tool that, that's going to work. It's not, not worthwhile using uh, ChatGPT uh, Chat 3. You need to go to ChatGPT 4, keep up the latest version, and you really need a paid version, which also enables you to, depends whether you trust it or not, but, but basically the free version of ChatGPT will train on what you put into it. Whereas for the paid version, you can tell it not to train on the data you put into it. So while you don't want to put any confidential, you know, absolutely confidential data into ChatGPT, at least the paid version is not going to train on that. So what well, they say, and I, I, I trust them, it's not going to train on that. So for any professional using, wanting to use ChatGPT, they definitely should get the paid version. It's about $30 a month. It's also faster. Um, it's just like any, if you don't want to use a professional tool, you really need to, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, but the main point is it's more intelligent than three. I think it's 30% more intelligent than version three. Fantastic. So here we're going quantitative, analyze and provide graphs for this file showing, file showing the results. So this just for that new person who's arrived, this is a fictitious file of the results of an evaluation uh, questionnaire that we've got chat GPT to prepare. Marie, the next one, please. Thank you. Cool. So now I, this, this is just, this is just what it created, right? So I didn't, tell it to use any graphing program. I just said, draw some graphs and give us some a summary of that data. And so it's drawn graphs. Now, again, you wouldn't want to just throw these in a report and whip it off to a client. 
you want to examine them to make sure that they make sense and it's, it's done the right thing. But this is a very powerful tool for playing around with the way you may want to visually represent the data. If you know what I mean, you can you can see, well, there's three, there's, you know, do I want to, do I want to use that graph? Do I want to use that graph? In the past, you'd have to manually go and create those graphs, do the analysis, and then go through that. It takes a lot of time. It kind of goes, hey, well, I think I probably want some graphs like this. Let's um, let's fire them up. And then you say, oh, I want to use this one. I want to use this. And I've just got a little thing. Caution needed using this with the ethical issues and indigenous data sovereignty in regard to the use of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Really good point. Thank you very much. Um, from Kelly, I think it is. Just, we had... Yeah, so what I'm what I'm doing is kind of an enthusiastic way of using this, but you note I used I got it to make up the data we're using here. So it's a, I, I would be very reticent to just dump in a whole lot of data into this with absolutely not, you know, not with people's names and things like that. If it was anonymous data, uh, uh, maybe. Um, obviously there's a question of indigenous data sovereignty, which we need to think about very carefully. So thank you very much for that caution. Kelly, I think it was fantastic. So I'm really sort of demonstrating what it can do, but it's very much the potential. We have to risk manage all of this stuff because otherwise we could uh, end up in all sorts of muddled. So there, there you've got it anyway. So as I say, I didn't tell it, I just said, draw me some graphs and do some analysis. So it looked at the data. Thank you very much. Next one, please. Cool. So that's, this, this leads on from what I was just saying in Kelly's point that um, I've got six rules for using chatbots. Um, and I'll just run through them. So, and this is also up on that resource site, the my, at my website, P50. Um, now, first of all, don't ask a controversial question. So there's all this talk about bias and things, and it's got biases in it because it is trained on the internet. And we know, you know, we know how crazy the inter internet is. Um, don't ask it controversial questions because you'll get nonsense, either nonsense or its guardrails will come up. So there's, there's no point discussing controversial things with it because you're just going to get you're just going to get you know either it won't respond or you'll get you'll get biases. Secondly, I know this sounds paradoxical, but don't ask it any question you don't already know the answer to, or you're able to figure out whether its answer is credible because it, it does this thing which is called hallucinating where it, it makes stuff up. It's like a very very keen uh, uh, intern on someone who who will just make stuff up for you because they they want to please it's very it's like very 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 keen to please that's like a big labrador for wavy tail and it will do anything anything that you like um so you want to be in a position where you can evaluate whether what it's telling you is accurate or not uh, you really need to do that before you can trust it well this is the current set of of, of ai that we're getting this is likely to improve over time though where it, it's like to get better now, rule three, talk to it as a conversation, not a one-off. It's not just a matter of asking business if you're talking to chatbots. Don't just ask it one question. Think of it, see, as I went through that, I had a creative discussion with the chatbot as we went, we went through. That's number three. And then think creatively to discover what's called capability overhang. Capability overhang is a scary thing. The people who build these systems don't know what they can do. And so it's really up to all of us to push the limits to see what it actually can do all of us with our own ways we may want to use it, our own backgrounds and our own thinking about risk management as we already had in the chat, is to, is to really sort of work, work these things to see what they're capable of and see what they're not capable of and see where they're making stuff up. Um, but think creatively about the way you interact with them and just fire all sorts of questions at it as long as we are risk managing around confidential information, obviously. But it, have a real go at it. It's really, really is, is the main message from that. Now, next one is be careful about putting out a lot of AI text. There is the temptation, you know, just what we've done. We could actually sort of just fire that all into a report, put our logo on the top of it and fire it off to a client. Now, that's, you have to be very careful about that at the moment because, first of all, I think, yeah, I, I you do, because there is the potential, if you put out a lot, a lot of AI stuff, that particularly if you publish it on the web, that at some stage things like Google might say, oh, this is all AI text, and that uh, you're, you, you may be downgraded in a sense for that, that, that because it may be the AI text comes to be regarded because of the way people abuse it as of not particularly credible or not particularly useful. So, so for instance, in my book, I'll, I'll talk about my book briefly later on, but I've, I've, I've got at the bottom human written book because I think there was this value and, and it is a human written book. It's not an AI generated book. There's value. So we've just got to be really, I just really need to risk manage that. Now, if, so the question is, 
if can you can you put a whole lot of AI stuff in a report to a client? I think if you discussed it with the client and you and you and you acknowledged it, then that may be fine. They may be perfectly fine. You say, look, I used AI to help write the methodology, and they might go, that's cool because it's, it's sufficient. But you really just want to be clear that if you just pump out AI text with a little proviso to that, is what's about to happen with the thing uh, called Copilot, Microsoft Copilot, also in Google Docs. Really, everything's about to become permeated with AI text. Basically, every email could well be written by AI as our emails as AI elaborates. So you're starting to see, starting to offer more and more detailed suggestions about about emails and things. So, so you kind of got to watch that space, but just just sort of be a little bit cautious at the moment about pumping out, obviously pumping out just AI generated reports. It's it's not quite as easy as that. And then lastly, just try out AI. So what I've talked about is just simply chatbots. So for just one one aspect of AI, there's a whole lot of different types of AI out there. Image generators, there'll be visualization generators, there's music generators, but there's also AI being woven into all sorts of different systems. So, so the main thing is just, and I'll talk later at the very end about you know uh, not you know overcoming AI anxiety, but really, really just just try these things out because you need to know about them, and we all need to know about them. And only if you try out them will we able to be, be able to get more uh, informed and regard them. I'm just going to stop for a moment and and have a look at um, these questions. Um, cool. So we've got is the data still? Yeah. So basically, it, this model was. The chat GPT was trained up to 2021. Uh, so it's sitting there. It only knows stuff to 2021. But what actually one stage chat GPT was able to do, but they just turned it off at the moment, but something like Bing or also um, Bard within Google, it, it, it's a chatbot with, with, that's when it learned its language. It's a little bit like, when did it go to university? You know, uh, someone went to university around about this time. But what they're doing now is they're wiring up the that, that language model, they're wiring it up to being able to look up the internet. So some of them can update. Now, as I say, chat GPT used to be able to do that, but they've turned that off just at the moment because they had some problems, I think, with the summarizing websites or uh, there was some sort of quasi-legal problem. So the point is, yes, it's only up to 2021, but if you get, and that's, that's chat GPT, but if you get one that can actually uh, Look at the internet of which Bard and Bing, the Microsoft Bard one and the Google Bing one, sorry, Bing and Bard, these names are very similar. Um, then what then it does actually look up the internet. So it can provide up to date up to date data. That's in there. Um, have you asked it to create some creative graphic displays? Bar graphs are a bit boring. Uh, I haven't just I haven't asked it to do that. That would be really interesting. So maybe someone. If anyone's got ChatGPT, they could try. They could try it out and tell us what it comes up with. But you're really good point. It can ChatGPT can it has these add-ons where it can access other programs. So it, you can get it to draw all sorts of diagrams, and it goes away. It tells another program what to do and goes away and creates it in that program. So there's definitely something that's coming. Whether exactly how it's implemented at the moment, not sure. Um, some point is for free access to the machine, um, fairly circumscribed. That might be. You see some good links that someone put up there. Thank you very much. And someone said, my 17-year-old asked Snapchat AI to summarize the first Harry Potter book in emojis. Totally useless, but very funny. Thanks very much. Yeah. So that's that's really like stretching ahead around what these what it can do. And this is exactly the type of thing that people should be doing. Uh, just to see, just try it out, see what happens. Maybe we could write a whole evaluation report in emojis, which might be kind of fun. Okay, next slide, please, Marie. Cool. So, okay, so that's just a very quick run through of how you could use um, AI to augment our evaluation practice. There's a lot more to it. You can see the transcript of that up on, the, on my website, uh, my website slash P50, where I've just put some resources for this talk. And um, yeah, just have a wee look through that and see what you think. And see what you think of, of what it's come up with. And also if you can get hold of a paid version of it, really have a go at it. And, and try out all sorts of things. But again, with the proviso, as uh, other people in the webinar have said, don't, don't put anything confidential in there um, until you can be assured it's a secure environment. Just on that, because that's so important, a lot of people are now working on having secure environments. Obviously, New Zealand government would be, or any government's interested in doing that. So it, will, I, it won't always be the case where the environment's not secure because people will get locked down environments where they can put uh, secure data. 
but until that comes along, we should be very wary. But we don't need to think the chatbots permanently will, will be insecure in terms of, of the data we put into them. Okay, implications for AIs. Now, there's a lot of implications of AI for evaluation practice, and I think we need to think through these, and they will emerge uh, over time. So let's just jump into a couple of them. I've talked about implementation process and outcome evaluation here. Marie, next slide, please. Okay, first is in, in regard to um, implementation evaluation. In implementation evaluation, we're always thinking about um, whether programs, this is just sort of a snapshot of a couple of ways I think that, it, that AI will affect evaluation. That's not exhaustive. We're always wanting people to be evidence-based. So here's just, I just, this is just an article about data and decision-making, how AI and data calls can help influence evidence-based policy change. This is actually sort of in the social and environmental area, something called the Scottish AI Alliance. But the main takeaway point here is that it is potentially incredibly good at collecting evidence. And it's very likely we'll get chatbots trained on bodies of evidence. People are trying to do this at the moment because they're a little bit wild, they kind of make up evidence, but I don't think that's going to be the case going you know, forever. Um, but the first, the first point really is if we want as part of implementation evaluation to make sure that people are using evidence-based policy, evidence-based programs and initiatives, I think AI is going to be a big game changer there because at the moment we kind of just rely on people being able to pick up on evidence. A lot of our job in a sense is, is trying to work out did people use evidence-based um, uh, program logics, there is a change. And so I think AI is going to make a big difference in regard to that space, that increasingly there will be the tools to make sure the evidence-based policy has been included uh, in initiatives. Next one, please. Okay, so the next one, if we, that was implementation evaluation. So next thing in terms of process evaluation. Uh, now, See, process evaluation is obviously, you know, describing the process. I, I always see that. As, I, I always, the way I define it is process evaluation is looking at the course and context of a program. But particularly about the actual details of the program itself, uh, AI offers the opportunity for real-time monitoring of all activity within an initiative. So if you just think about that, so at the moment, we retrospectively often go back and or, or sometimes we have been involved in process evaluation, which is you know occurring at the same time. But we end up plowing through documents, we end up interviewing people about what's happening, etc. AI holds the possibility of a real-time monitoring of what's happening in an initiative. And this is really, this is really kind of a quantum change, a real step change here. We should be thinking in terms of evaluated practice. So all of a sudden, because in a sense, we could if they was like a spotlight, we kind of apply our spotlight, but in a sense, this is saying the lights may be turned on all the time with AI monitoring what's happening in a program. Now, I just want to give, show you a, a piece of software or a platform that, that, that talks about doing this. So next slide, please. So there's various initiatives about this. I know there's one that there's a, even one in Wellington called Hoist, which is working on this, this type of thing. Um, but there's this, this uh, platform called Akoda, which is Akuda. Dakota, which is a, an AI-based platform. Now, from their blurb, they say that it's the world's first ops intelligence platform. And they talk about it being a new standard for modern operations visibility. What this thing does, it continuously just monitors the entirety of what's happening. And obviously, just what the organization wants to think about. But you can say, look at all of our emails in real time. Look at all of our documentation of this government department. Look at all of our legislation. And constantly monitor this and what that's what it does and then it actually what it does is you see what the customer says continuous insights into alignment and guidance on actions and that whole that concept of insights into alignment and guidance on actions really summarizes process and formative evaluation doesn't it it's really what we, we're trying to provide insights into alignment between activities and outcomes and we're trying to provide recommendations about action in a sense that almost describes the process evaluated and the implementation form of evaluator's role. So here we've got AI, in a sense, offering to do something very similar to what we do. So this is a very, I think it's a very, very interesting development. And I think we'll see more and more of this. So as I've said at the bottom, isn't this basically process evaluation that it's doing here? And in that case, what it does, this thing's monitoring and what it said uh, in one presentation I saw about it, basically said, 
we'll monitor all of everything's happening in the company and then we will report on on like they call discrepancies or whatever you know management by exception and they in that case the example they could gave yeah, they said we could tell you that for these customers you were spending a lot of time on these customers but but you're not getting much profit from these particular customers so that i know that's in a commercial context but for evaluators that's exactly the kind of insight we'd provide from process or implementation evaluation and here ai is spitting this out automatically so so i think that's the space to watch real-time monitoring in effect process evaluation of programs um happening next slide please marie oh sorry just before we do that okay so isn't this too dangerous in a big brother in real life Thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> um, if you just go back to the previous slide, Chris Marie. Um, just give me one moment. Yes, so well, there's several points there. Yes, there's, so there's the whole sort of big brother thing happening here. This thing, a coda, would be paid for by companies, you know, that they would say what they wanted it to look at. But there's a whole ethical thing here around around surveillance. Obviously, it's going to be surveilling. Um, uh, it's going to be surveilling staff. It's all go also going to make you know visibility uh, things about customers too. So very very good point. There is a big brother element. When you say is it too dangerous? This, these these products are happening and they're out there. So it's a matter of grappling with them. And regulators should be thinking about this. This is this is really really good points. Thank you. And then someone said, it's good to emphasize um, being careful about chat GPT because it produces very credible information. Looks totally credible, but it may be complete nonsense. So a very good warning there. Next, the next point, please. Now, what I'm on about here is, this is just the, the last example of how, um, how it may affect, AI may affect evaluation. A lot of evaluation and quality assurance relies on documentation. You know, if you think if you think broadly about evaluation, often people will use documentation to assess the quality of a program or to, to screen which programs need further investigation. So at the bottom, we've got what the program is actually doing. Then we've got the documentation. And then we've got the assessment of the documentation. So really, the, the issue here is AI could produce per, almost perfect documentation for every program. This will disrupt the way in which documentation is used to screen programs. Do you, if you see what I'm getting at there. Basically, uh, say you take it, even if, say you think of a food safety system as, a, as an evaluative process, they look at everybody's documentation of all the companies producing food. And if there's, that someone's documentation is weak, they'd say that we need, they need to be revved up. Um, but if everybody's producing overnight and just ask ChatGPT to produce perfect documentation, then, then that, that kind of evaluative plank gets knocked out of the process. So I think this is a space to watch. Uh, very interesting development. Next slide, please. And just to illustrate what I'm talking about here, this is actually from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the States. This is, a, this I know you can't read it, but this is a set of guidance for how you evaluate your documentation. So this really just highlights the fact, this is the Environmental Protection Agency monitoring what people are doing. And they've actually got guidance for how people can, you know, what needs to be in people's documentation at this level. So it just shows the role of, of documentation in evaluative and quality assurance processes, which we need to keep our eye on. Um, and then we've got documentation is only useful if it's used and implemented properly. That's absolutely right. Thank you very much for the comment. But the, the, the thing is that it costs a vast amount of money to work out whether people actually are, are, are being consistent with their documentation. And that's really what evaluators get often paid to do. But anyway, the main point here is that every, a lot of people's documentation is going to be a lot better than it has been in the past. And how will that disrupt the evaluative and the quality assurance process? It's just a little thing I want to raise. Next slide, please, Marie. Okay, on outcomes evaluation, we have the and we've, we've got obviously possibilities for disruption there. Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, just that one. Yeah. So this is from um, the Harvard Business Review. So this is talking about using AI to track how customers feel in real time. So they are now. So this is a, you know an example of outcomes. So they're already saying everything's moving. We can now start monitoring real time outcomes. So I really just wanted to put that out to illustrate that point, but also to illustrate a further point if you go to the next slide. And what they say in this next slide is uh, basically um, they say it's easy to see why 
quantitative surveys became popular because you could ask a lot of people. But qualitative research was too labor intensive, which is what they say. But now they say technology is changing that whole thing. And they're now suggesting that you should go after qualitative information, as they're saying, first, as much as you do quantitative information. So I just wanted to highlight this. You know that anyone who's who is, I don't know, I'm not sure, exactly sure where they are, but you know, the qualitative quantitative debates and evaluation raged like some sort of war for a long time there when I was doing my PhD. Um, but basically, this is saying that AI changes the balance between quantitative and qualitative, makes qualitative a lot easier, a lot less, less expensive. So I think there's just sort of fascinating things about methodology and, and mixed methods which are going to come out of this AI revolution. So that was to highlight that. Next slide, please, Marie. Okay, so we're now into the third point. I've just got a, uh, probably another five minutes or so, Marie. Um, on social implications, social impact of AI for evaluators. Now, this is a huge topic. We could we could run a whole day workshop just on this. Um, I've just written, so I've just really referred to my book, Friending AI, 30 Fresh Ideas to Help You Think About Artificial Intelligence. So this really what I'm trying to do in this book is talk about a lot of the impacts, including the social impacts. And obviously they some of the I don't the book's not about evaluators, but but they are relevant. Uh, if you could flick to the next slide. Thanks, Marie. So that's the 30 fresh ideas to help you. That's just what the book looks like coming. It'll be up on Amazon in September. So just next page, please. Okay, so these are just, I don't have time to talk about these in detail, but these are just these are just some of the social impact concepts from the book. One is this idea of upskilling AI. And if you look at the, the page I put on the resource site, you'll see the best way of thinking about AI is that it started off, if we think about chatbot, started off as just a knowledge function that could type. And, and receive written. And it's slowly been getting new skills over time. And if you look at that web page, which is up on the resource page, you'll see, you can just see basically AI is just getting more and more skills. It's it's able to it's able to talk, it's able to hear, it's able to write software, it's able to use software. Soon it will be able to use money. It can interact with websites. So that's just one way of looking at AI, progressive process of upskilling over time. Next one is analyzability, which is the idea which you've really just explored, AI's ability to analyze all sorts of data very, very efficiently. And, and we've just talked about the qualitative, we can analyze qualitative, not just quantitative aspects of that data. Next concept is knowledgeability. And what this is getting at is AI changes the whole dynamic of knowledge accumulation, knowledge sharing, and knowledge transmission. I don't have time to go into it here, but, but basically, there's a whole lot of interesting possibilities for around educational inequality, where AI, all of a sudden AI provides a lot of people with possible access to all sorts of knowledge they didn't have access to in the past. Nudgeability is another concept I talk about. That's the idea we all know there's algorithms influencing us. And the idea of nudgeability is for us to get control of those algorithms and get them to nudge us in, in a positive direction. Rather than us on social media just being nudged to buy stuff, Nudgeability is the idea that if we got control of the algorithms, they could nudge us in the directions we want to get in, we want to go in. Trustability is another one. So in, a, in an environment of AI where there's endless, what I'm calling info trash, anyone who can give a trustability network, you know, say you can trust this information, is going to be in a really good position. Next one is revenge of the real. And that's the idea that people may rebel against all of this, this AI and artificial world. You can see that almost in that um, in, in that uh, Mission Impossible film that came out, the the uh, the star there actually he he, he rode a motor was it a motorbike yeah I think he rode a motorbike off a cliff. He actually did do that. He had a parachute. But that was a selling point. It wasn't just created um, by it wasn't created as you know by artificial intelligence. He actually did that in the film. That's kind of example of revenge of the real people were actually wanting some real stuff, not just artificially created stuff. And then lastly, AI anxiety. That's just what I want to finish on. If you just go to the next slide, please. Okay, so as a psychologist, I'm mean, also a clinical psychologist, so I feel obliged to um, deal with, uh, help people deal with uh, AI anxiety. So I've got a little acronym there. So this is really what can happen when you start thinking about AI. And I, and I do know a lot of people who are immersed in and at the cutting edge. They actually, they sort of are staggering around some days about, where they see where things are going. 
The first of all is to check out AI as much as possible. If you know about something, it can reduce your anxiety of it. The next is just reflect on what it means to be uniquely human. You know, we're, people are worried about AI taking over, but there are a lot of human aspects, altruism, compassion, uh, certain aspects of mindfulness, which are uniquely human. And we should, we should start to value those. So don't, you know, don't really think AI is going to replace everything about being human. Next point is the I. If, the, if there are major impacts, say, on jobs, it's not just an individual problem, it's a social problem. So don't personalize it too much. If, say, 30% of the population is put out of work because of AI, it's going to be everybody's problem, not just your problem. Next is limit your anxiety using standard kind of anxiety minimization techniques, as you talk to any psychologist about. And then lastly, the last L, is show leadership in responding to AI. The best way of getting on top of worrying about something is to get actively involved in and pushing forward on that thing. Um, and, and just what the people really said in the comments, really thinking thoughtfully about it and getting involved in discussing and discussing AI in various ways. Thank you. And just on to the last slide. Okay, so um, if any of you want to be notified when my book comes out, just email me at drpaulwdeigen at gmail. I'll throw that up in the chat in a minute. Um, if you want to get in touch, I'm on LinkedIn. Just go, just search LinkedIn. Dr. Paul W. Dykin on just search on Google. You can go, you can get, check me on my website. So if you go to the URL drpaul.online, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to find my website. And then lastly, the the, the notes from this this presentation are at pauldykin.consulting uh, slash p50. So there's some um, they're not the notes, they're more the resources for this. So just before I finish, I'll just check. Um, Oh no, so we haven't got any more comments at the moment, which is cool. I'll throw up my email address. So if you want to get in touch about anything, just email me at that address. But if you want to get in touch, if you want to know when the book's coming out, let me know. Um, and I'll hand back to Marie. So thank you very much. Sorry, there's a, very, there's a lot of stuff to cover, but I really just wanted to give you a lot of stuff so you could um, think about it. And then lastly, um, Marie, I'll just post up a couple of questions for people who could email about oh, me right. for feedback. Sure. Oh. Thank you so much, Paul. That was that was an extremely in-depth and illuminating um, presentation. I will just stop the share right now so we can all, um, if you feel like it, do turn on your cameras. And um, even though we have 71 people, um, please uh, put up your hand and we can take questions. Um, just to start it off with, um, Paul, I, I have a question. And I've been playing around with, with AI, not, not on a professional level, but on a personal level for quite a few months um, as soon as um, it has come up. And interestingly, I do note that the quality of the results also depends on the wording of your questions, um, the quality of the question, and also if you use ChatGTP or Google Bard. And um, I haven't played around with Bing as yet, but I, I'm just keen to get um, your views and probably everyone's views on what they actually prefer in terms of plain English, GTP or Bard or Bing, and what they have noticed. Like, I'm keen to get everyone's views on your personal use of um these tools um, in terms of how you phrase a question, you know, um, the detail, the level of detail you use when you phrase a question. So, yeah, the flow is open to anyone who wants to talk to this point. Paul, what do you think? Um, well, I have had some people comparing chat GPT, GPT, Bing and Bard, and they thought well, it depends on the nature of the question. If you want any fresh information, you've got to go to Bing or Bard at the moment. You can't get it from chat GPT because it's not hooked up to the internet. Bing sort of is fairly limited. This, this is just very impressionistic, depends on the question, but it kind of tells you, it'll tell you answers. Bard, which is a Google one, can give quite more detailed answers. So I had someone the other day, they were comparing responses on the three and they thought for that comparison, Bard was really good. But it's like anything, <clears throat> depends on how you want to actually use it. But back to your question, there's this thing called prompt engineering. Mm. It's about the way you ask the question, and that's really important. So you should really play around with the way you ask the question and have an online, ongoing dialogue with it. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm just checking the chat, and um, there is a question here. Do you have a concern about the output from ChatGTP? It's generally bland. Um, 
anodyne. Can you can you start to spot AI output because it is usually usually verbose and boilerplate? Do you think um, this will improve? <laughs> yeah, that, that's absolutely true. So I I think the deficits of AI are a good thing. So a lot of people say you know it, it, they, they they point all these bad things. I think those things are good at the moment because. The central problem for society is trying to get our heads around this as quickly as possible. So the more problems AI has at the moment, I think the better, if you get what I mean. Imagine if it if it was absolutely perfect. That issue would be a very dangerous situation. So just one a minor point there. When AI has a problem, I actually go, yay, that's good, because that gives a little bit more time. Um, you can use prompting, so you can say, write it in a different way, you know, write it in a more exciting way, and to some extent it does that. But if you don't do that, it will produce a beauty plan kind of boringish response um so and i think for those of us who you know i think really the added value will be trying to do things a little bit differently um so it does produce a boring response the way you ask the question though you can modify that to some extent but i think still people will be able to have a bit of an edge in terms of responsiveness hopefully for for a while thank you um do we have any more questions? People, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, so I'm, um, I'll confess that I haven't been experimenting yet, um, but I should, and I'm feeling like a dinosaur and I need to, to get on with it. Um, but do you have any guidance on how to learn good prompting other than just experimenting? Is there... I've got we've got your six rules. You've given us a few things, and I'm looking forward to looking at your um, website. If you have a look up on the internet, you'll find lots of discussions of prompts. The best thing though is to play around with it and and see um, see what you can do. But you can just remember you can tell it to play a role. You know, so it's quite useful to go acting as a so and so because it, it's if you just ask it generally, it doesn't know what it is. You know, like. It, like if, if 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 someone's asked an evaluator or a psychologist or something, you 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 already know, you, you respond as an evaluator or a psychologist. You see, but poor old Jack GPT doesn't know what it is until you tell it what it is. So it's always useful to start as an evaluator, as a psychologist, as an expert this or an expert that, or or as a primary school teacher too, because because it, it. I mean, it, I'd say just play with it basically. You can have a wee look at the prompting stuff on the internet. But I mean, you can say to stuff, I said the other day, explain nuclear physics to a five-year-old child. And it started talking in a way that a five-year-old child could understand. So play around with it. But I would, if you can get hold of the uh, paid version, it's going to be a little bit smarter than the other version, the, the, the free version. Um, I was sneaking another question. Um... So, Paul, right now, there are many organizations that are writing official AI policies, um, you know, how, how people should um, kind of be, be cautious when, when they are using. And, and as these things are still in development, many employees do not know the extent to which they are allowed to use AI for client-centered work. Um, do you have any recommendations or advice for such organizations that are currently implementing these policies? Yeah, I think it's a terrible muddle. I think organisations need to get on top of it. They don't not necessarily ban the use, but they need to be very clear. Because what what's happening at what I suspect is happening at the moment, people are randomly using it, and organisations don't know that they are. So, say you said to a government agency, "How much of your material is produced by ChatGPT or another large language model?" I suspect government agencies would have no idea because analysts might be feeding their, that up to their supervisors, hold, hold evaluation reports or policy analysis might be going to supervisors who don't know it's produced by chat gpt and then it's being put out on the website of the organization so i think organizations i'm not saying they should ban it they just need to be very clear they should be providing guidance as soon as possible to their staff about it and the, the problem is the time frame is extremely tight this is you know like social media took 20 years to get up and running the internet took 20 15 20 years this thing's happening over months so so I think that they should be very proactive. They should they should just call it interim guidance and they could say, this is what we're doing at the moment. Uh, this is how you can use it. So they might say, at the moment, you can use it to have a discussion with us about concepts, but don't, don't feed any AI written text into the system 
unless you clearly identify that all the way through. You know, they could, that's, that's the kind of thing. And then as they don't put confidential stuff in while we work out ways of having these firewalled AI environments. So I, if I was an organization, I'd really get guidance. I mean, the say, um, the DIA has already put out um, under Paul James put out some um, guidance at the moment for the public sector in New Zealand. So, but the sooner there's guidance, the better. That, just, that just is a brief really... comment, um, Marie. Um, I yesterday I attended an Institute of Directors um, deep dive on um, AI and and governance, and there was some talk. I mean, obviously from a governance perspective, so it was thinking about the legal implications, um, privacy issues, those sorts of things, and what what directors or governors might be needing to think about these sorts of things. Um, but um, yeah, there's a, so real. Um, that was an actual and like a, a deep dive session. Uh, I found it quite useful. Um, so it might be the sort of thing if anyone's on the call who wants a bit more uh, um, and, and another uh, alternative avenue, just, you know, from a different perspective, that might be something to keep an eye on because it's certainly an issue that the IOD is um, is taking some time to, to uh, share um, seminars a bit like this um, with. But yeah, that lack of a lack of a framework is is one of the key things and, my my takeaway message was actually you need to come back to well what's kind of what are the core underpinning values of the organization itself and then you need to develop your operating principles in alignment with that some commercial organizations are going to be less concerned with certain things over and above just meeting kind of legal um legal requirements um mm. whereas others might take a particular position on what is or isn't acceptable because it is or isn't um, in alignment with their organization's values. Yeah, so just a little reflection from a very fresh, <laughs> fresh experience. Thank you very much, Cara. Yeah, Paul, would you like to respond to that in some way? Oh, that, that's fine. Yes, I think I totally. It's it's it just raised the thing about the why I find AI very fascinating. Everywhere you look, it raises all sorts of. Issues. I was at a meeting, a conference yesterday about AI, and just this whole thing of liability, which obviously relates to directors. Mm -hmm. Someone was saying, you know, directors, because of health and safety requirements and, and that requirement being on directors, that's changed health and safety. Now, the, the issue with AI is who's liable? Is it, say, AI, AI, AI makes a mistake, is it the directors of the company, which it could, they would be involved, but is it the people who develop the AI? Is it mm -hmm. the material the AI is trained on? Um, and, and, you know, AI doesn't have personal liability the way that humans do, but should this mm. should this be the case? So so you just even look at just, just you've just mm. raised a tiny little bit and yeah. there's like a hundred, hundred issues, hundred <laughs> years of issues in the middle of that little baby. And then it's like, yeah. how, how people, you know, how it affects people feeling as from a psychology, whatever, how, how, how it affects people feeling about themselves. Another one. And then it's like, the whole society is permeated with massive uncertainty about everybody's future. So everywhere, mm. I, and everywhere I look, it's just, Boom, 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 you know, big stuff. So um, it makes it exciting, but kind of frightening at the same time. Even though we are at time, Ruth has a has a hand up. So go for it, Ruth. Oh, I just had a quick question about, you talked about the potential to not just sort of scan a sample of reports that a human could do, but to, you know, scan everything a program has generated or whatever. Um, but that is putting data into or through a system um are there some providers that you know of that um have put more emphasis on being locked down or data staying within australia or within new zealand or um giving more assurance about how the data will be managed well th this is exact exactly what has been worked on at this moment so as i understand it, microsoft azure will be Trying to will is or will be offering that sort of thing, or and they're not the only ones. There's a company in Wellington called Hoist, which is working on op, op, what sorry, their product's called Hoist, it's called Endgame. They're trying to do that. So everybody's everybody the, the basic thing about AI is if there's a people say, Oh, this is a problem, that's a problem. Well, if there is a problem, you can be sure that like a thousand people with PhDs are trying to fix that problem because they'll all get millions of dollars each if they do. So pretty much if if AI has a problem, someone's working on that as we speak. 
So that is an identified problem and there are solutions. I just, already there may be, there are solutions emerging and they will more and more, but the obviously people to talk to would be like government IT people who whose job it is to protect data. But I think the, that, that problem is going to be sorted out. There'll be secure AI environments very soon. Thank you so much, Paul, for a very practical and engaging um, session. Um, everyone, the, this recording will be uploaded in four weeks and you will get, um, a, um, I'll ensure you'll get a prompt for that. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. We can't wait to read your book when it's out. Um, nice. And I'll make sure everyone gets knows about it when it's available on Amazon. And good luck in your AI endeavors.